Well, I hope your summer's off to a great start. And I know as, as I watch that film, I think, oh, that's a lot of stuff I saw on that that I'd like to be doing right now. That looks like a lot of fun. Hey, I want to say thank you uh, to each and every one of you that have signed up so far for our Bless Every Home uh, that we've made aware to you. A few weeks ago, throw that slide up on the screen. You got it? Um, a few weeks ago, I made, made you aware of a program that's called Bless Every Home. And it's just a fantastic opportunity for us to be able to pray for our neighbors by name. And uh, you can go to blesseveryhome.com and uh, just give them your information. There's no fee. There's no cost to you at all in this. And uh, if you tell them where you live, and what they do is they will provide you each week the names of neighbors who live all around you, uh, up to 40 or ever, how many you want. And they will, they will send them to you however you want. You can do have them sent to you every day. You can get them uh, a few times a week or once a week, whatever you want. But it gives you the opportunity to pray for your neighbors by name. And uh, we just uh, uh, launched this a, a few weeks ago and have had several of you already sign up. And I just took a quick glance yesterday and it looked like already uh, over 600 homes have been adopted in our community and uh, around 800 prayers have already been prayed for those families. Isn't that awesome? And uh, I don't know about you, I believe in the power of prayer. Do you? And I, and I really believe that when we take that serious, and, and again, you don't, it, it, this is such an easy way. I like to walk in my neighborhood, and it's just so cool to be able to walk by and know that I'm getting to know all of these people by name. And so that as I pray for them, uh, I can pray for, you know, for Terry and Sally and, you know, Jim and Sue and, and all these different folks. It's just so cool to do that. And, and I want to encourage you. You can sign up for that, and uh, then there's a place where you can list what church you're a part of. And and it puts you in our group so that we can all stay connected. And what an, a great opportunity for us to be light in the darkness. Just want to encourage you. What a great way to spend the summer. Um, how many of you have ever gone to Ancestry.com or done some work with genealogy for your family? Anybody ever looked at me? Yeah. Yeah. How many of you have been surprised by things you found? Anyone? Yeah. Um, Wanda loves genealogy, and uh, she loves to kind of dig back. I, I don't know that I really want to know where I came from, you know. Uh, you know, my family came out of the hills of Tennessee, and I think that's all I want to know. You know I, don't think, I don't think I want to dig any deeper in that. But uh, it's, it's so fascinating because a lot of people make incredible discoveries. Um, there was this guy that, that, that just a few years ago, throw his picture up on the screen there. Um, this is Drew Howe, and that's his daughter, uh, Grace, and his, and his wife, Pam. And um, he was into genealogy, and he had had a bunch of stuff on his family. Then he went to Ancestry.com and kind of tied into a whole new thing that kind of linked him around the world. And he knew he was from over around England, Scotland area, all that kind of stuff. And as he was doing that and he was connecting with people who lived over there, he, he got an email from a guy in London who said, you know what, I think that you are a direct descendant of Thomas Stanley III, who was the Lord of the Isle of Man, this island off the coast of England, between England and Scotland. And uh, he started doing some research and he goes, no, you are a direct descendant. You are, by birth, the king of the Isle of Man. Now, would that freak you out just a little bit? Now, here's this guy. Now, now Drew was, I mean, he was just a mechanic. He was just a mechanic that lived in Maryland. And, uh, and all of a sudden, now he makes this discovery. So he and his wife and his daughter decided to, to, to go see this island that he was now the king of. And so they went, and uh, he got the chance to, to meet people. And, and there were some people going, like, you're our new king. Like, wow, you know what? And, uh, but, it, but it was such a crazy thing. In fact, throw that next picture up on the screen. I love this. <laughs> Dude, that would be me. If I found out I was king of an island, I'd be like, yeah, you know, just kind of... Right, he he did. He went through all of this stuff, and and uh, it was it was just an incredible, fun, fun experience. But he finally decided at the end of the day that he really didn't want the responsibility of being king for an island of people, and so he abdicated it. And it kind of goes back to you know being under England, all that all that kind of stuff. But what a ride to finally discover who he really was. Look at me. Do you know who you are? What if I told you this morning that you were more than what you think you are? What if I told you today that you 
have ancestry roots that make you royal, that you too have direct lineage to a king. Well, well that's the journey I, I want to take you on today. Um, we're in this series called Summer in the Psalms, and we're looking at these different psalms through, through this, these next months. And uh, the, the psalm I, wanna, I want us to look at today is, is such a beautiful, beautiful psalm. It's Psalm 8. We're going to throw that up on the screen for you. I'm going to read this. This is from the New Living Translation. We have Bibles in the pews. They are New International and Spanish Bibles. If you need a Bible, take one home. Uh, if you have a friend who needs a Bible, take one for them. These are our gift to you. I want you to have the Word of God. But I'm going to read this. This is from the New Living Translation. He says, O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky and I see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you've set in place, what are mere mortals? Yet you should think about them. Human beings, that you should care for them. Listen to this. Yet you have made them just a little lower than God. Now, there are translations that will translate that word angels. It's the word Elohim. And it can, it can be translated every way. But I, I really like how the New Living Translator translates it. Because the fact of the matter is, when God created us, the Bible says he created us in his image. Amen? He created. So you created us just a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority, the flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea and everything that swims in the ocean currents. Read the last sentence out loud with me. O oh Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Well, I want to I unpack this psalm a little bit for you. And I want you to take good notes, and I want you to really spend some time this week thinking about who you really are. Are you ready? Let me give you a few things that this psalm teaches us that we got we to grab. Here's the first one. God is the source of our true identity. God is the source of our true identity. When we begin to talk about who we are, so much of that goes back to how do you define yourself? What, what, what's the criteria that you use? What are the, what, what's the material that you use or the resources that you use to, to frame your thoughts about who you really are? And, and for us, we've got to go back and say, the psalm teaches us that that goes back to God. Don't you find it interesting? I thought this was so cool when I caught it, that, that the first verse and the last verse of the psalm are the same. Oh, Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Love this. The, the psalm just talks out by, starts out by talking about this is who God is. And sandwiched between who we know God to be, that's where we discover who we are. You see, you will never, I put this on your outline, you, we will never discover who we are until we discover who God is and who he created us to be. You see, so many of us define ourselves by other people's terms. And this is why we have, to, we have to claim this for our own true identity. Let me give you a couple thoughts, and some of this will be helpful to a few of you. We are not defined by our parents. We are not defined by our parents. Now, I'm not slamming your parents. Some of you had good parents. Some of you had moms and dads who were loving and kind and godly. Some of them spoke good things into your life. Some of them told you how wonderful you were and what a prize you were and how thankful they were for you. Some of you, some of you had that, but if we're honest, there's a lot of us that didn't have that. Some of us had moms and dads who were absent. Some of us had moms and dads that were never there. Some of us had moms and dads who were ugly and abusive and, and, and not people who gave good things into our life. In fact, some of you probably read in the news, you see the, the story this week about the mother in Cleveland, Ohio, who um, decided to go on vacation 
And she went, took off for 10 days. And she went from Cleveland. She went to Detroit for a while. Then she went to Puerto Rico. She was gone for 10 days before she came back home. She left her 16-month-old toddler by themselves at home for 10 days. By themselves. And the toddler didn't make it. And when I'm reading this story, I'm thinking, how, how can people do this kind of stuff? Well, here's the deal. We live in a fallen world. And for some of us, man, we had parents who brought a lot of garbage with them into their life and into their adulthood, and some of them dumped some of that garbage on us along the way. I, I guarantee you, if we could tell stories today, some of you would grow up talking about the names that you were called growing up and the things that were said to you, the things that you were told you, you're, you're never going to be anything, you're never going to amount to much, you're, you're, you're not worth anything, you're a mistake. And some of us grew up with those messages, but here's the deal. Your parents don't get to define who you are. You see, they may have given you birth, but it's God who gives you life and gives you eternity. Our definition, our roots go back to someone higher than who our parents are. We're not defined by our parents. I'll give you another one. I know you're going to be thankful for this. We're not defined by our past. <laughs> We're not defined by How many of you are thankful for that? How many of you would say, I've made a few mistakes in my life? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and, and here's the great news. When I, when I was going through this psalm, one of the things that I, I realized is that when David wrote this psalm, this is after the fall. You know, we were created. Mankind was created perfect. But then Adam sinned, and sin entered the world, and every generation since we're steeped in sin. I mean, this is not a, a, a perfect group of people that David is talking to. But David is talking about God's ability to take fallen people and redeem them by his grace and take a creation and remake them into his image. If I, if I were to speak the names to you and, and say Moses, David, Samson, Peter, Paul, if I, were, if I were to give you all of these great names from Scripture, do you know what all these people have in common? They were tremendous failures. Tremendous failures. They denied God. They committed murder. They, they, were, they were taken over by their egos and their arrogance. They, all, all of the stuff that you go, back, you go back and read about. If you look in the Bible, these people are a mess, amen? <laughs> They're a mess, much like us. But that's the great news of the gospel of Christ. Because if any man be in Christ, he's a brand new creation. The old is gone and all things become new. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. I, and this is so important. Because there are some of us who have made mistakes in our life. We've sinned in our life in, in ways that we go, you know, I'm, I'm not worthy of, of the grace of God. I'm not worthy to, to have myself defined. by none, Look at me. None of us are worthy of that. But he gives it to us all. I'll give you one more. You're not defined by other people's opinions. You're not defined by other people's opinions. Doesn't matter what people say about you. Doesn't matter what your what your family members say. It doesn't matter what your friends say. It doesn't matter what the kids at school say. It doesn't matter what the people at work say. It doesn't matter what your neighbors think about you. It doesn't, it doesn't matter because the in the end of the day, the only person's opinion who matters is God. Because you're not going to stand before any of them. You are going to stand before him. And let him define you. I had a, a guy that I played basketball with years ago in college. His name was Victor. Victor was uh, almost deaf. Uh, he was very hard of hearing. He had hearing aids, could hear just a little bit. But Victor, it, it was so funny. I can still remember watching Victor go to a free throw line. He was going to shoot a technical foul. And he reached up and he turned his hearing aids down. And, and I thought, what a great opportunity. He, he's at the line. The crowd's going, yeah, miss it, miss it. You're not going to make it. You're not. He, he, he can't hear a thing they're saying. I thought, that's beautiful, man. Don't you wish you could just turn off all these things that people are saying around you? Look at me. I want to say it again. Other people don't get to define you. Not your friends, not your family, not the people. Who are, not, none of these people. Look at me. None of what they say on Facebook. None of that matters. Only God defines us. 
You see, when we become the children of God, when we accept Christ into our hearts, we link ourselves to the lineage of God. I I love how the scripture says it. John 1, read it with me out loud. He says, but to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become the children of God. 1 John 3, 1, read it with me. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. That is what we are. That is what we are. You'll never discover who you are until you discover who God is and who he created you to be. Let me give you a second one, and some of you need this badly, I know. God has endowed us with great worth and high esteem. God has endowed us with great worth and high esteem. I I love when the psalmist says, and he has crowned us with what? Remember what he says? He crowned us with honor and glory. Honor and glory. The honor is how we are regarded and the fact that God regards us highly. It's, it's like uh, someone who's an official or someone who's in a prominent place and you have high esteem for them. That's the honor we give them. We, we give them their due. The, the word glory is a, is a word that literally means weight or worth. And it has to do with, with, with the intrinsic value of this that you have. And he says God has given us both high esteem and he's given us, he's given us honor. And we need to claim that for ourselves. Because quite frankly, some of us don't think of ourselves as being worth very much. And we should. Uh, Look at the passage of Scripture there on your outline. 1 Corinthians 6. Read it with me. He says, you should know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit that you have received from God and that lives in you. You don't own yourselves. God paid a very high price to make you his. So honor God with your body. How do you value yourself? Do do you see yourself as someone precious and priceless? Or do you see yourself as someone not worth all that much? Um, There was a woman in Racine, Wisconsin, a few years back, uh, woke up one morning, and late in the morning, uh, it was like her worst nightmare. She received a text message on her son's phone and saying, we have kidnapped your son and we are going to hold him for ransom. We're going to beat him every hour until you pay up. Uh, Do not call the police. And the mother, of course, freaked out. I mean, her son was 23 and she just couldn't believe that someone would do this to her child. And and she, but she did call the police. She goes, I'm not going to try to do this on my own. And, and so she called the police, and the police came, and they're, they're looking at the text messages with her. And uh, the police contacted the cell phone company and said, let's run a trace to, on that phone. Let's locate where that phone is. And they found that it was about 10 or 11 miles out on the side of a road in a country area. And uh, so the police uh, sent units out there, and they, they, they kept her texting back and forth with them while they, they surrounded the van where that, that, that was there. And uh, when they opened the van, they discovered it was just the son. And he was the one sending the text messages all on his own. And the police had already figured that out. And you know how they figured that out? The kid was only asking for $250. <laughs> How many of you, you'd sell your kid for $250? It's <laughs> and I laugh. But, but, but get this. You see, the kid didn't value, him, value himself enough to even make it look real. I love you guys, but some of us are that way. Some of us don't value ourselves enough. Some of us don't value ourselves to treat ourselves the way that someone of worth really deserves to be treated. Some of us don't regard ourselves in a way that we we don't allow other people to treat us as anything less than what we really are, precious and priceless children of God. Amen? The text in 1 Corinthians 6 is actually a section of scripture where Paul was talking about sexuality. 
and he was talking about why we should uh, be sexually pure and that why we should keep sex confined to marriage. And he was talking about this idea that, that this sex was a precious gift from God, and we need, we need to recognize these bodies are temples of God's Holy Spirit, and we, we shouldn't flaunt that or, or treat that cheaply. And I, I flash back when I, was, when I was working on this, I was thinking about Wanda uh, back in our, our church in Phoenix. She used to do these purity weekends for the teenage girls in our church. And... Uh, and she would lead them through, her and some of our adult leaders would lead these girls through a, a kind of a, a, a recognition of who you are and how God defines you and that you're created with beauty, you're created with worth. And, you know, and she would, they would talk to them about, uh, about why, why it was important to, to save themselves and for, for marriage and have the, having these kinds of conversation. And it was so interesting because Wanda, Wanda made statements. She said, you know, she goes, I determined a long time ago that I'm worth more than what some guys are willing to pay. And she said, I, I realized, she goes, I, I decided that, you know, I'm not going to give myself away sexually to some guy because he takes me out to dinner and a movie. That's just not going to happen. She says, if some guy wants me and wants this body, it's going to cost him everything he has for the rest of his life. And it has. <laughs> and she's worth it. <laughs> Amen? You better believe it. You know, Jesus makes an interesting statement when he talks about respecting ourselves and how we treat ourselves and the things that God gives us. He says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, he says, you know, don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs because they'll trample the pearls and they'll turn and attack you. Here's what Jesus is saying. There are some people, they're not going to treat you as an, uh, someone of worth. They're going to treat you as an object. They're going to treat you as a commodity. Don't give away the precious person that God created you to be. Amen? Does that make sense? Amen. I put the statement on your outline. You know what? You won't be respected by others until you respect yourself. Very true. Last thing I want to I want to say to you this morning is that God has empowered us for significance. God has empowered us for significance. Two things that he says in the Psalms, the Psalm 8, that I thought were really interesting. One is how he talks about you, you give them charge. After he says you crown them with glory and honor, he says you give them charge of everything that you've made, and they put everything under our authority. In other words, God, God created us to have an impact on this world. But it's really interesting is earlier when he says, you've taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppress you. Really interesting. One of, one of the commentators I read on this psalm said that his belief is that David wrote this psalm right after his encounter with Goliath, the giant. And how David, in, in writing this, was talking about, God, I can't believe that you would think of me and, and that you would use me. And he talks about, you know, he writes in here, you know, that God uses the infants and he's, you know, the, the babes and, and how he silences the enemies through things that are very small. And, and, and when you think about that, isn't that the fact that you go through Scripture, you discover that God takes what is weak and makes it strong. Rewind the tape with me for a second. Go back to when the people of God were in Egypt and they were enslaved. How did God free them? Do you remember? He had Moses' mother put Moses, he was a baby, put him in the river, and, and, and out of that little baby, he grew up in, in Pharaoh's home, who eventually came back, and he was the one who set him free. I, I wonder if Pharaoh would have ever dreamed that when his daughter brought this little baby in the house, that God was going to use this little baby to bring down his entire kingdom. And here's David, a little shepherd boy who God uses to slay Goliath over and over again. And finally, you get to the New Testament, and, and here comes the Messiah charging to the earth. And how did Jesus come? Did he come on a stallion with a sword, you know, attacking the government? No, no. He came as a baby in a manger. You see, we got to get this. 
Because when we think of God, how he uses people, we think that God only uses people who are super talented or people who are super gifted or people who have all kinds of incredible abilities. No, 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 no. He, he uses infants and babies and the weak. God uses people who don't know a lot to show a lot of who he is. I love when they describe the disciples and the people in the book of Acts were, 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 couldn't believe the, that the apostles were doing the things that they they were doing and they said you know what we how can these guys do this we know them they're stupid you know they're just a, a bunch of fishermen they're a bunch of unschooled ignorant fishermen but God used them don't please don't miss this God has created and recreated you for significance and he wants to work through you. I, I love the passage of Scripture, Ephesians 2 10. It's one of my favorites. Read it with me. For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. God has given you dominion, He's given you authority in this world. He's empowered you with his Holy Spirit. And if you've surrendered your life to him, he's put spiritual gifts in you that he wants you to use. And those can be demonstrated in a lot of different ways. And God works with us daily if we're open to touch and impact our world. Okay, can I just give you a, a real easy example of this? Um, I have mentioned earlier about the, the bless every home thing. And when I walk in our neighborhood, I, I pray for the, for the people and, and, and all that. And one day, it's just a, a, a couple weeks ago, now, I was, I was walking and I was praying and I was, had prayed already through my list of neighbors that I had for that day and all that. But as I was continuing to pray, um, I felt God nudge me um, with a family who lives right across the street from us. Uh, they are neighbors of ours that we know by name. And they are neighbors that uh, we actually have a key to our house. And, you know, we help them when they're on vacation. They help us when we're, that we're on vacation, that kind of stuff. But for some reason, they, they came to mind. And I felt like I had to pray for them. And so I did. I just said, God, I don't know what's going on for them. Um, but I, I pray that whatever it is, that you would be right there with them. Lord, they're great people. Would you put your arms around them? Would you give them your comfort, your strength? Whatever they're going through, whatever their need is today, would you bless their home? Lord, there's a short prayer. And after I, after I finished praying, when I was walking back to the house, I, I have the, the gal's cell phone, and, and I, I texted her a message, and I said, hey, Candy, I said, just wanted you to know, God, God brought you guys to mind today as I was walking, and, and so I prayed for you. Don't know if anything's happening, but just wanted you to know I lifted you up before the Lord, and, and uh, just wanted you to know we, we love having you guys as neighbors. God bless. She texted me back, and she said, Steve, thank you so much for that text and that prayer. She said, you know, this is my first Memorial Day without my father. And she said, my, every year my father and I on Memorial Day would go out to the cemetery and we would put flowers on the graves of some of our family members. And, and she said, when Memorial Day came, he was gone, you know, he wasn't there. And, and she said, for the last few days, I've just been so down and, and been struggling. And thank you so much. For, for remembering me today. Thank you so much for, for lifting us up. And when I saw her a day or two later and, and uh, we were talking about some stuff, she gave me a big hug. She said, you'll never know what that meant to me. Now, again, please hear my heart. That wasn't a life-changing thing that I did. I mean, that wasn't a, a world-rocking, you know, preaching to thousands kind of thing. But it touched one person in a way that God needed to touch them. And trust me, for her, that was significant. Amen? God has created you for those things. Nineteen fifty-five in um, Bangkok, Thailand, they were putting a new highway through. And there was a um, Buddhist temple that had to be moved to make way for the highway. 
And they had uh, moved a lot of the stuff out, but they, had, they still had a Buddha statue that was massive that they had to move. Um, throw that picture up on the screen. It, that's not that. It, it looked like that. It was a, a clay, a solid clay statue that had bits of uh, colored glass in it. And uh, it was almost 10 feet tall um, and weighed over 10,000 pounds. I mean, it was massively heavy. And so they had to bring in a crane to move it. And so they, they came in with this crane, and the day that they were going to lift it out and move it, it began to just pour down rain. And so they, they covered it with a tarp, and they said, you know, we'll wait till tomorrow and come back and move it when it's, when it's not raining, so we don't want to damage it. Well, the head monk of, of the monastery there, of the temple, um, in that evening decided to go out and just check, make sure everything was okay with the statue. And he went out and he lifted up the tarp and he began to shine his flashlight to, to check it out. And when he did, he saw something that kind of glimmered and he got closer and he realized that a piece of clay had fallen out and there was something shiny underneath. And so the next day when they, when they got it moved, they began to look closely and here's what they discovered. Throw that next picture up on the screen. That statue was not solid clay. That statue was actually solid gold. It had been covered with clay. And the historians trying to figure out what happened went back. The statue was probably four or 500 years old. And what they discovered was that about 200 years before this, uh, the Burmese army was coming through the area where this temple was. And they were looting everything and killing people and all this crazy stuff. And, and the monks knew that if they saw this big gold Buddha, they're going to they're gonna steal it. And so they covered it. They covered it in clay and put bits of colored glass in it to make it look at least decorative. But to fool the Bur Burmese army, and it did. They didn't take it. But they killed everything, everybody off. So there was no one around who knew that it wasn't a clay statue, but that it was actually solid gold until 1955 when they moved it and they actually discovered what it really was. Look at me. That's you. That's you. That's you. You see, some of us, when we look in the mirror, we see this thing made of clay. But that is not what God sees. And that is not who you really are. Look at me. Baby, you are golden. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask my prayer partners if they would go ahead and come. And this morning we would count it a privilege just to be able to pray with you today. And this morning, I don't, I don't know if this message has meant anything to you. I don't know if it's been important to you or if it's been helpful at all. But this morning, if you're, if you're still trying to discover who you really are, I hope you'll let the, this psalm sink into your heart. And, and maybe, maybe this morning, one of your prayers that you need to pray is to say, Lord, I, I need you to help me see what you see. I need to believe who you say I am and not what other people say that I am. And if you, that's your prayer, the song that Rachel's is gonna do, Laron Daigle's You Say Song, it's, it's perfect for you. And you can pray right where you are. If you want someone to pray with you, our prayer partners are up here. They would count it a privilege to pray with you. Some of you may have other things going on in your life. You may be going through health issues. You may be dealing with some crises. You may be struggling with some stuff financially. I, I don't know what your need is, but, but today I, I don't want you to leave without knowing that we're here for you, to walk alongside of you, and to lift you up however you need to be lifted up. So while Rachel does this song. If you know the song, sing along with her. If you don't, just let the word speak to your heart. But if you'd like someone to pray, our prayer partners are here at the front. Feel free to come on up. They'll be happy to pray with you for whatever your point of need is. Rachel. I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me 
I will never measure up Am I more than just the sum Of every high and every low Remind me once again Just who I am Because I need to know Father, as we come to you today, we're just so grateful for the words of this song. That sandwiched in between those two beautiful verses that tell us who you are, we discover who we are. That we are creations made in your image. That we are crowned with glory and honor. That you have given us authority, put us in charge, and made us for significance. Oh God, I pray that you would help us just to camp in this psalm for a week and let your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts things that we need to hear. We, we live in a world that wants to define us. We, we live in a world that doesn't regard us very highly or, or treat us as valuable creations. But you say, oh God, we're loved when no one else loves us. You say we're strong, even though we can't think that we can really do anything. You, you say, Lord, we are of great worth. Even when this world wants to cheapen us, disrespect us. God, my prayer is that you would help us to cling to you with two hands of faith. And that we would hold on to you and allow ourselves to be defined by God alone. Oh, how we thank you, Lord, for the love that you have lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God, because that's who we really are. In your precious name we pray and we give you thanks. And everyone said, amen. <laughs>